one o'clock and we're legal. And this is the call to order for the Groundwater Users Advisory Council for the Phoenix Active Management Area. I'm Frank Fairbanks. I'm the chair. Uh, and other members, please introduce yourself. Hi, I'm Leslie Myers. And Steve Bales. Thank you, Chairman Fairbanks. Um, my name is Natalie Mast. I am the AMA director. You're used to seeing uh, Kyle Miller here at the GUAC meetings, uh, who was also AMA director. Uh, he has left the department. We were very sad to see him go, but I'll be taking his place for these GUAC meetings now. So. I'm Bailey. I'm the new Groundwater Users Advisory Council coordinator, and uh, it's great to meet everybody. I'm James Hefter. I'm an analyst for the Colorado River Management Section here at DWR. And online we have Melissa. Melissa, do you want to unmute yourself? I'm Melissa Sykes. I'm the Water Management Assistance Program Coordinator. And in the room should be Tao Lee. She's the WMAP intern. She's letting people in right now, but she'll be in in five minutes. <laughs> uh, Maybe you want to talk a little bit about meeting logistics? Sure. Let's go ahead and item two. start item uh, two. You're not sharing to the webinar just again. I'm not. That's so interesting. We meet so often that a little brush up on the <laughs> the I was oh, you know what? It's because I was playing with the audio and then I oh she sorry about that okay all ready so we're going to meeting with your six uh, members of the public we ask that you please keep your phone muted during the meeting this helps reduce the audio feedback if the, during the meeting you have a question, please feel free to type your question in the chat box, and then it will be read and addressed at the end of each agenda item. If you'd like to speak to the council, the call to public will be the time to do so. Please indicate in the chat that you would like to speak, and we will unmute you. Otherwise, for those who are present, please just raise your hand, and I'll go ahead and call on you when you'd like to speak during the call to the public. And this meeting is being recorded and will be posted to ADWR's website and the YouTube page once the meeting is generated. And finally, if you have any technical difficulties, please contact our help desk. Their contact information is found on the screen right here. Thank you. Committee, any questions for Bailey? That was pretty simple, wasn't it? Right. Straight forward. Let's move to three, Colorado River update. And I believe Natalie Lee is going to introduce a guest who's going to do a presentation. Sure. Thank you, Chairman Fairbanks. Uh, we have James Hefner with us uh, from our Colorado River management section here to uh, provide us with an update on Colorado River. Okay. Next slide, please. Okay. Oh, sorry. <laughs> sorry. Uh, thank you. Uh, I, I guess I have to start off. I, I hate these mid-month, you know, discussions because what has happened is the next, you know, in short, you're getting the information that was from the last month's update and or it's in between when I prepared the slides and when you receive them, uh, the new one has come in. But nonetheless, the good news is not much has changed. Uh, the system status for the reservoirs are pretty much, I mean, a little bit more in Flame Gorge, um, 91%. Blue Mesa is still 91%. Throw Point's 94. Navajo is still 78. Um, the elevations and volumes for Powell have shifted slightly, but they are nonetheless still 41% full and 32% full, respectively. System storage is still 44%. It's still 25 and change for the acre feet for the year. So we're still we're looking a lot better than we did last time. Uh, next slide, please. As for the snowpack and runoff, it was it was a good year. Uh, it's, it's probably a great year in the context of the last 20 years or so, but a good year nonetheless. Um, snowpack peaked in early April. Sweet, 161% of the seasonal median. Um, 
there was some concern, at least, as how much of that would actually be realized in this year's runoff. But it, it worked out pretty well in the end. Uh, April to July runoff is forecast to be a little under 11 million, excuse me, 11 million acre feet. Uh, from a water year perspective, you can see where this year falls in context of previous years. I mean, this graphic is again from the June forecast, but July uh, is not much different. Uh, you know, it wasn't a 2019, or it's not forecasted to be a 2000, excuse me, 2011 type of year. It's been you know a little bit more than a 2005, 2019. Uh, not too shabby. Uh, of course, you know, one, one good year isn't going to fix the, the system. Uh, but still, it's it's hard not to get excited. So, so James, for clarification yep. for me, is this okay? Yeah. To understand the difference between, I guess, water year forecast and April, July? April to July, yeah. 14 and 10. Which one are we going with? Well, both, depending on which one. The water year is the one that everyone really watches. That's, That's what we get. That includes everything through uh -huh. September. So. That's some type of. It's a fifth. So it's water year, which is through the end of September. So it's October through September. Yeah, okay. I mean, we have so many different years going on right now. I mean, water year, the calendar year, mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. seven years. Yeah. But, okay, thanks. Yep. Uh, as you say, uh, just before we leave this one, I mean, the lower basin, we, we we're also likewise fortunate as far as inflows, the uh, inflows from dams was much higher than the normal that we've seen. We had releases, you know, from Alamo and the Bill Williams. We had releases on Painted Rock and the Gila actually had water flowing down to all the way down to Colorado. Uh, you know, it hasn't happened since 2010. I mean, it, it was, like I said, I don't, I don't like to get excited, but it's, 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 it's just hard not to be at least a little happy, if you will. Next slide, please. Oh, you have a question? Just, and, and if it's at a later slide, then we'll just wait. We've heard a lot about it being an El Nino year or beginning to be an El Nino year. Have we seen any evidence of that yet, or is that something that would come later next year or later this year? I think or, or is it on another slide? It's not another slide, and I think it's still a, a lot of uncertainty as to what we can look forward to next year. I mean, historically, we, you know, if you're looking for perhaps another wet year like this year, I would not put your money any money on it. I would expect to see much drier conditions again. I mean, it's just, we just haven't seen it. We don't have that kind of system. It's very flashy. We're fortunate to get what we have, but I mean, it, it, like I said, I wouldn't bank on two years in a row or anything beyond that. Thank you. Okay, these are the 24 month study and the CRIMS projections. Again, these are from June. Uh, you know, the most recent one came in was two days ago for July. But there is really no, still no difference. No, well, there's no real significant change. As of June, it was 35.75 in Powell. That was the end of the calendar year 2023 projection. Uh, problem in was at 35.64.31. Calendar year 2024 and projection was 35.91.35 feet. With the problem in at 35.45.91. And again, every, for July, the you know, it's 35.75.32 instead of 35.75. So, you know, it, like I, said, I do apologize for for having <laughs> previous month's projections, but it doesn't make any principal difference, at least at this point in time. Do these numbers, if they, if this was to happen, do these numbers trigger any additional rounds of cut from the river? Uh, that will show up on the next slide a little bit, but. I mean, and, and really, the short answer is we're, we're on track for a tier one reduction, just based on the information that's in the models right now. With you know, the end of calendar year projection is 1067.05. As of June, it's 1066.2 for July. The problem in is 1061.16. Um, end of calendar year 2024 is 1057.42, with the problem in at 1042.33. And again, that does, we're on track for tier one. With things, you know, all the information that's in the model right now, that doesn't take into account anything that happened with we still got the draft SEIS out there. Um, but this is, you know, for everything we, we know now. Next slide, please. And this, of course, is the, the SEIS and the, the ongoing process. The you know, end of last year, they initiated the SEIS for. You know, to address the deteriorating conditions we're seeing in the river, we are seeing um, that process resulted in the release of a draft in April, which had two 
options. They both had increased cuts, but it was really the distributions that were different. One was through a uh, perceived straight priority system, and the other one was more distributed to the, the states, to distributed the cuts more proportionally to the, to the states. Uh, and result of that, the lower basin came up with their own proposal, which is currently being worked on and modeled by recommendation. Uh, it was 3, million, 3 million acre feet in additional conservation, not attributed by state in the agreement, but that's just currently broken out. And, you know, Arizona is set to you know, 1.1 million acre feet, California 1.6, and you know, 285,000 acre feet from Nevada. Um, those are in addition to what may happen with the guidelines, uh, the reductions, contributions, DCP. Uh, it's all voluntary. There was no mandatory reductions. So some of these things are still being uh, worked on and, and trying to finalize agreements with reclamation. Um, the idea is at least have half of it uh, achieved by the end of calendar year 2024. Uh, next slide, please. Of course, that's the interim, the, the short term. Uh, longer term, we've got post-2026 looming uh, when, the, when the guidelines and uh, we need to derive and agree a new operating criteria, criteria, which along with any necessary legislation agreements has to be done by January 1st, 2027. So things are pretty, pretty hectic, pretty busy right now. Um, you know, the notice of intent to prepare the EIS was published June 16th. We're currently in the scoping period with comments due August 15th, 2023. Uh, and the anticipated six month alternative development phase, which is also a you know, very fast track that's coming up. And then we have the, you know, the draft EIS is planned for December 2024. Who's the lead agency on the EIS? That should be Reclamation. Okay. And that's all I have. Uh, if there are any questions or if you have any questions after the fact, uh, please contact me. Any questions? Any questions in the chat? Any, any, uh, any no. questions from staff? No questions in the chat. No questions from staff. Nobody asked for questions. Audience? No? No questions, sir. Okay. Thank you very much. Great briefing. If only we had more water. <laughs> At least it's a little worse. It's <laughs> <laughs> not altogether bad. Okay, let's move ahead with the next item, item four, which is the WMAP project updates and funding request. And uh, is, are you going to handle that, Natalie, or is that? Uh, I, I can handle that, or you can handle that, however however you would like. Well, do you? you are you going to make a submit a presentation on these three projects? Uh, I'm not making a presentation. We're going to have the folks from U of A and then Gilbert uh, do a quick presentation on their projects. Mm -hmm. um, and it, either at the very end or after each presentation, uh, the council can discuss and potentially take action. Okay. Uh, now, these are funding requests. Correct. And the role of our committee is to make a recommendation to the director. Correct. The actual decision rests with the director. Correct. And I'm, the, historically, the director's paid a lot of attention to what we recommend, but he is free to do something different and occasionally does, which is fine. Um, so uh, our role is a recommending. Do you want to talk just a little bit about the funding source for these? Sure. Uh, so the Water Management Assistance Program is funded through a portion of the withdrawal fees. Um, Melissa, I, I know you're online. I know you're going to provide some updates about the WMAP program a little bit later on the agenda here. Um, do you, I, I guess I'm not quite sure what you're looking for. Would so you like some additional I, detail about I guess that? Or? I'm looking for it, and, and maybe they have, but. I take it that funding is available for these projects, which is not to say they have to be funded. Yes. But but these three projects don't put us over the budget or in a deficit situation. Sure. Melissa, could you maybe provide a little bit more information on balances? Yes. So in Part C for the WMAP activity update, that's where I'd be providing the uh, actual funding, the status of our funds for the WMAP program. If you'd like, we can do that first and then do the presentation. But uh, as we stand now, the SmartScape 
project was already renewed for a two year contract because we had some schedule or scheduling conflict with the having the GUAC meeting and the end of their contract. So the only project that would be requesting funding would be the town of Gilbert's smart irrigation controller rebate program. Uh, but we do have funding to cover both of these projects this year. Are you, are you ready to go or did you want our briefing first? I, I was just con wanted to make sure that funding was available. That was all I was asking. <laughs> uh, now, whether it's wise to spend the funding, that's something else. But I want to make sure that it was clear that there is funding and we're not we're not talking about a deficit situation or anything like that. That's correct. Do you want further briefing? Yes. Go ahead. Funding is available. Go ahead. Yeah, I assume it's going to be this. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Okay, so then why don't we hear First, from the University of Arizona Smartscape Professional Landscape Program. Done. So, uh, hello, my name is Jacob Perez Lorenz. I am the Conservation Specialist at AMWA, the Arizona Municipal Water Users Association. Um, Rebecca Sr. is the new uh, Assistant in Extension for the University of Arizona Cooperative Extension. Thank you. Um, she is um, running late or unfortunately is not being able to make it. I have reviewed this presentation though and I would be happy to speak on it at this moment if you would like um, or we can see if she will be uh, coming within the next few minutes. Um, but I, again, I'm happy to roll through this uh, presentation real quick. Um, but I'm I'm fine if you're familiar. Uh -huh. Could I ask for a clarification? Sure. sure. Uh, Natalie, did you say this has already been funded? The direct one. Is? Yes. So we had a little bit of a timing issue with getting this scheduled, where um, their previous approval expired, and we, in in order to keep them funded, because uh, the department does see this as a, a valuable program. Um, we we chose the director chose to uh, go ahead and extend the funding prior to the meeting of the GUAC. So there's really no need for action on our part, or would you or you you if could we're happy we could say we like it. You could choose to do that if you would like to. <laughs> I think I'd like to. Okay, go so ahead. Uh, <laughs> kind of make it brief. <laughs> of course, and a lot of these slides are just to demonstrate um, because SmartScape is a training education program for landscaping professionals. A lot of them are just uh, good, good, feel good slides about uh, the students that have been participating within SmartScape. Um, next slide, if you would. Um, so again, SmartScape is uh, landscape uh, training for professionals within Maricopa County. It is being operated by the uh, University of Arizona Cooperative Extension. Um, and then Rebecca Senior is the new um, coordinator for it. But the whole premise of SmartScape is to promote those principles of Xeriscape, water efficiency in all landscapes. Uh, we want to be able to train professionals in landscaping and then we want to be able to engage uh, customers to make Xeriscaping desirable. Uh, next slide. So here are just some examples of the classrooms within the Cooperative Extension. That's actually on um, Broadway Road. Uh, I think it's 32nd Street. And so the U of A's Cooperative Extension has all of those in-person uh, educational classes for SmartScape through multiple courses. We are so glad that they're all in person again. Um, we had to take a brief hiatus. Um, uh, let me um, backtrack just a, a slight bit. I say we because AMWA is a major sponsor of SmartScape. We contribute uh, half of the funding for SmartScape as well. And so I'm just using the term we, even though I'm not associated with the university extension. Just want to make that clear. Um, next slide. <clears throat> More examples. Uh, the benefit of having these in-person uh, educational classes is that you are, are able to have those hands-on experiences with the technology that's going to be used for efficient landscaping and geoscaping. Um, just more examples. Engaging with students, a lot of our, um, a lot of the instructors are within the field. They have been professionals or uh, educators for years, even decades. Um, one of the uh, groups of individuals who attend SmartScape are municipal employees from around Maricopa County as well to make sure that they are integrating these principles within their own conservation or parks, any kind of efforts that, deal, that deal with landscaping. And so sometimes the uh, instructors are municipal employees, they're horticulture experts, they're irrigation managers and experts, and so they want to be able to be in the classroom together. Next slide. Um, this is just highlighting a specific part of the core courses for SmartScape where on the final class, we make sure that we 
review how uh, any landscaping professional can be marketable. Again, we want to engage those customers to desire zero scaping or low water use plant landscaping. Um, and so this is just demonstrating that on the 10th class, we make sure that we, and while included, shares all the information that we have uh, for efficient water. Uh, next slide. So there are also uh, short topics that um, there are just presenters from um, various institutions that come in on special topics. This can be for urban forestry, uh, specific sustainable landscapes, and so sometimes SmartScape will um, ha have those uh, individual short topics as well from other organizations. SmartScape is also offered in um, Spanish, so it's uh, SmartScape Español. Um, there is a very clear need for engaging Spanish-speaking landscapers within the valley um, as they make up a, a good portion of the landscaping contractors' uh, population. And so we want to make sure that these core courses are being able to be translated within Spanish and then taught um, also in Spanish by instructors in Spanish. So uh, that's the continued effort uh, of the Maricopa County Smartscape in Spanish. Uh, next slide. Again, just other examples of the same course being taught just in Spanish to Spanish speakers. Next slide. Um, okay, so there is the core course of SmartScape on the fundamentals of landscaping. However, SmartScape also offers advanced courses. This is an example of irrigation courses. The top right actually is uh, the town of Gilbert's Jeff Lee, who uh, irrigation master, if you've ever met him, um, lives and breathes irrigation. And so <laughs> you can see him really in depth there. Um, these types of advanced courses are high in demand. We want to make sure that even if someone is able to go through SmartScape and get the fundamentals through a core class, if they are in their position where they are going to be the irrigation manager, uh, that they have those fundamentals within this advanced course. They're slightly shorter than the other courses. Hi. They're slightly shorter than the other Apologies. courses. <laughs> no worries. Um, but uh, we want to make sure we continue to offer those advanced irrigation courses. Um, just another example of these irrigation courses. And then um, I guess for the record, um, Rebecca Senior is uh, present here right now. Um, My apologies. I was on First Avenue trying to get into a parking garage and oh. Um, <laughs> no worries. I now know where it is. <laughs> I knew. <laughs> no worries. Um, we are, I was just going through the presentation. If you'd like to um, sure. take part, but um, go ahead. Sure. Um, so this is the, uh, the first thing I say, uh, again, apologies. Nothing worse than being late. Um, and I am the new SmartScape coordinator, although I'm not um, new to training or um, new to the valley. Let me stand up here so you don't have You're welcome to sit I have, the table if you'd like. Sure. I have been in the Valley since I was five and so really understand the environment. I have worked in other like industries, the Desert Botanical Garden, kind of an industry, where I ran the landscape school for seven years, worked there for 10, and promoted two professionals who I really enjoy working with. Uh, the best practices. Our nine-month program had a capstone installation of a Habitat for Humanity for each class. So over the years, um, I helped coordinated the installation of about 28 landscapes. And we used rainwater harvesting. And I introduced that because it's important to me. I just wanted to say, although new to SmartScape, I'm not new to the importance of what is happening and it's important to me. Okay, so uh, this is the advanced SmartScape irrigation and these are courses that will deepen the understanding of the concepts. It gives them, you know, the, the courses are small, so it gives them an opportunity, as you can see, to work with and ask questions of their instructors. And we use battery operated controllers so that they're actually working with a um, controller and programming. So that's the advanced SmartScape. This is two of our instructors, Doug Donahue, one of the industry experts that we have that is uh, teaching them about the efficiency of nozzles. And so we, that's our apparatus for SmartScape that was built so that he can quickly turn the ball valves and go through all the different types of um, 
irrigation efficiencies in the sprinklers. And then the catch cans are the red things. Um, if you don't have the cat or eat a lot of tuna fish, then you could buy those catch cans for the water to go in and then you measure it to see your efficiency. And so these are the advanced um, techniques that we are teaching. So we have really wonderful instructors. Dr. Ursula Shook is from the University of Arizona. Judy Milkey is a landscape architect, uh, certified arborist. She used to work at the Desert Botanical Garden a long time ago. She's the author of one of the best books on uh, plants for uh, native plants for, for landscapes here. And of course, Donna G. Francesco from um, the uh, city of Mesa. So I, I also uh, want to point out the Spanish Smartscape. I know on an earlier slide it talked a little bit about the Spanish language classes and they're really important to us. And the people that are our trainers, Raul Puente is the, I don't really know his, I can't tell you his exact title of the Botanical Garden, but he oversees the collections and the uh, recording of the uh, um, accessioned plants. And Jaime Toledano works there, so we have um, great people for both of our tracks. Um, and for the advanced irrigation, uh, as we saw on that slide, Doug Donahue is there with the um, sprinkler heads, advanced plant materials. Um, Kirti Matura was the Smartscape coordinator until recently, so I have been here only for a small amount of time. Um, but uh, have known Kirti and many of these people for many years, and um, she is a, a wonderful colleague of mine. Richard Atkins is the now was city of Phoenix, but he is now in the city of Tempe as the urban forester, and he is teaching our what we're calling urban forest management. And so that's a term that maybe a lot of our um, trainees don't know. And so by introducing them to the idea that they're managers of a forest, it's a collective forest, um, we teach them how important that is. This is some numbers. So um, the green box at the bottom is separate. That's since 1994 at the beginning of the program where we have graduated 2,441 students. And in 21, you can see there are graduates in the other column. Next to it is those registered. Some of our students uh, register, but then they have to come back to the next session uh, if they have too many absences, and we have um, ways to help them complete what they started out to do and be successful. So there is some difference in those, but you can see that um, the numbers that we have had and um, 2023, the last three years. This is from our um, survey that we do at the uh, training, training program to see who are we reaching. So in fall 2022, you can see that the large, largest column was, um, okay, since I'm new to this, I'm trying to, to see what it is, the darkest color. Uh, so it says realtor homeowner, I would believe. So it's a little hard to, to get. Um, I believe that the other one with two would be the HOA representatives. And municipal employees are the second largest. So we have a program to help municipal employees come in and get the training. That's fall 2022, who we were reaching through the survey uh, in 23. You can see that we had in 23 a lot of municipal employees. And reaching the professionals and the municipal employees is our goal. They're multipliers in the community. They bring that information out many places, and um, so we're really happy to have municipal employees. And in our Spanish class, um, here's an opportunity to do some more marketing. Uh, you know, municipal employees are not on there. And so um, I'm hoping to reach out to the, the cities through AMWA or any other way and get some of our Spanish language speakers into the program, more of them. And uh, the advanced classes, um, we have not just 
in the professional industry who Smartscape is focused to, we also, you can see, have landscape architects and designers. Um, HOA representatives, whether they're on the board or in the um, property management, there's some associations of property management that we market to. And so we're trying to reach as many diverse members of the green industry and bring this information to them. And then the urban forest management, that's the new course. Um, Richard Atkins, Atkins is teaching that. That's a, a tree that was planted at the uh, Maricopa County Cooperative Extension, the Ironwood, the old man of the desert. Um, and of course, we already sort of uh, talked about advanced irrigation by seeing some slides. So um, we have a lot of municipal employees that are getting advanced irrigation training. And, you know, this is the website. This website was um, created by the supporters of Smartscape. Um, you can find a trained professional there. So uh, the landscape uh, workers are um, given the choice if they would like to be there and referenced. Um, and, of course, viewing our courses. This is, uh, this is the web page for Maricopa County Smartscape. There is also Smartscape in um, Tucson and a new one in Pinal County. And so, you know, thank you. I, thank you. <laughs> I wanted to say thank you in the beginning. Thank you and, and, uh, and do a couple other things that Kirti has tutored me that are part of this meeting that I may not really understand that well. Um, so I want to say uh, we are requesting. I don't know if you have already said this, Jacob. Yeah, I think we've already. Uh, you already did the thing that I understood I was supposed to do? No worries. Thank you kindly. Anyway, I'm really happy to be shifting from uh, working in urban horticulture where I was at the Cooperative Extension. I've been there for 10 years. I went from the Desert Botanical Garden there. And I'm really excited to be serving. Um, well, it's my mission. Uh, to help people live better, and it's the university's mission, to help uh, them live better is, of course, um, having more sustainable cities, more livable cities. And uh, so, happy to be here. Any question by the committee? Wh which project is it on this sheet? Because we use WET and different I don't acronyms. I'm not sure. Mm -hmm. This might be separate. It's the only training that's on the bottom. On the bottom of page two? On the page two. Yeah. Oh, that's their previous contract. Melissa, Melissa will talk through this uh, during her presentation. All right. So with Melissa's information, like any matrices, like what does it cost per student hour? Or, you know, well, um, yeah. So I, I, I captured those. Or a buck. That's I captured. Absolutely, yeah, the return on your investment. I don't know per student. Um, our printing costs are a big part of it, and so I did bring, the, but a valuable part, because this reference material goes out into the community and stays. Now they have access to the website. This is the manual that they have for the basic course, and then the study guide, which has been, if you'd like to look at the study guide, you can see at the front the people who have worked on it, um, the industry professionals, people from the University of Arizona. And so they leave with that. And the last course, I know on the slide, it showed that we have a um, marketing and resources class. And that's to help them continue to be connected to this information. To have, we don't require continuing education units from our students, um, but we trying to keep connecting them and, and bringing them back to advanced classes. But this is another thing that is supported by, especially uh, that they get um, the three booklets that are here. I know you're all probably really familiar with these, but these are, um, these are just cornerstones of them helping clients. These are available by giving clients a card with a QR code so they can access them online because, of course, the print is not always available. So we are teaching them how to do those things. So what is the um, annual amount of the grant? I'm sure on one of these pieces of paper here, that's very clearly stated. Would, would but you, to save I, us digging through it, what is the magic number for the annual 
and you'll support the the, uh, the department. Melissa, do you have that number? Yeah, this project was renewed for 100 and uh, sorry, I just I literally just had it. $112,896 over the span of two years. That's, that's for a two-year program? Yes. And we've been, we've been doing this for several years, I guess. Mm -hmm. We've had it in the past. Yes. You, how many years we, how many years we've been in this program? The program has been in existence since 1994, but it did start out almost as a grassroots through AMWA. And, um, and it was a, was the was the uh, well uh, what resources it's there <laughs> but uh, so how we have you... four previous contracts with four previous contracts and they're all two years or they're one years it looks like the first was might have been four years and then they went two years after that. Again, it's your money question, Sam? Oh, it helps. It helps. But it doesn't line up with this either. Yeah, it is on the, the money. You've already got the money, so thank you. <laughs> it's on, it's well, on thank this you. page. It's on that page. Thank you. Yes, if you look at, at 71923, it's CMA okay. product status, but it says as of September 2022, but in progress is this smart gate landscape. Okay. So that's probably when they accepted their renewal. And so the, the two years started when just and it could be approximate, but that, that started a couple months ago or it's a, it's a fiscal year, so it's it just started. So July one fiscal yeah. year. Yeah. Okay, great. Right. It's right there. Thank you. All you had to do is find the right page. All right, right page. <laughs> yeah. okay. Any other questions from the committee? Thank you very much for your presentation. It might be easiest if if we do our little recommendations after we do all three and we do them all. Okay. Uh, I knew it now. So the next one is. <coughs> Who's next on the list? Uh, next on the agenda. Tom Gilbert. Yeah. Yes, Town of Gilbert. All right. Uh, well, thank you all for your uh, time today. Uh, my name is Jeremiah Churchill uh, with the Town of Gilbert. I'm the Water Resources and Conservation Coordinator. Um, and we currently applied for a grant uh, for our Smart Irrigation Controller Rebate Program. So just to give you a little bit of a background of the Town of Gilbert, um, we do have a diverse water portfolio that consists of groundwater, surface water, um, and reclaimed water sources. And when we're talking about reclaimed water, we're talking about sewer water that is treated to near drinking water standards and that is used solely for landscape irrigation. Um, and out of those, groundwater is the only non-renewable uh, water resource. Um, and just to give you a little bit of the breakdown of our water supply, which is kind of important when you're looking at those numbers and you're seeing the 40% from CAP, um, so um, this is, uh, you know, long-term reductions in CAP um, will result uh, in unsustainable groundwater uh, pumping. So, uh, you know, a goal of ours is obviously to reduce our demand. Um, next slide, please. Um, and the bluff, and I'm not sure if you're all familiar with the bluff. I did not know what that was when I started here, but the bottom line up front, and I don't get enough time listening to myself speak. I do a lot of listening in general, so I'm just going to read this to you all. Um, we are up against unprecedented challenges for the Colorado River Basin, coupled by a mega drought, rise in temperatures, acceler uh, accelerating evaporation, parched soils soaking up melted snowpack, and over allocation of water supply. Lake Mead and Lake Powell reservoirs are at historically low elevation levels. Despite the favorable hydrology, one good year of snowpack and runoff will not replace what 23 years of drought have done to Lake Mead and Powell. Um, in response to limited Colorado River supply for the conceivable future, the Town of Gilbert will continue to strategize for reduced water supply through critical problem solving, planning, and community engagement. Um, so as this mentioned, Arizona is facing some of the largest cuts 
um, and users throughout the Phoenix Active Management Area are experiencing water access reductions. Um, to protect the river system, we, uh, all users uh, need to do their part and reduce water use in a multiple of ways. Um, next slide. Um, so just to um, kind of talk a little bit about um, the Colorado River shortage strategy. Uh, one of those is operation resiliency. And we're talking about that, we're talking about meeting our demand. Um, so some of the, the strategy we, we have are innovative um, projects that would allow us to use existing resources um, in new ways. Um, also, that could include um, exchanges, um, agreements, uh, improvements to infrastructure, um, new wells, um, and also with a long-term portfolio of sustainability, this is basically just talking about the preservation of our long-term um, supplies um, and the need to reduce demand. Um, and then this is my bread and butter, water conservation and efficiency. So the Town of Gilbert has a variety of rebate programs um, that we have seen uh, be very effective. Um, along with our outreach, message, outreach messaging, um, shortage stage requirements. We have different ordinances in place um, to re, um, restrict uh, um, high water use landscapes. Um, and also uh, the installation of more AMI meters. Um, technology is really helping um, conserve water. So we wanna make sure that we're using those uh, as much as we can um, and also grants, and that's why we're here today. Um, next slide, please. So just, uh, just to give you a, a little bit more about our water supply reduction management plan, the town of Gilbert is currently in stage one. So this solely focuses on um, you know, custom ed customer education and uh, municipality, our, our municipality kind of um, being efficient in our landscaping, our irrigation, our messaging, um, so that we can set the example for other um, community members, HOAs, businesses. Um, so we are only in stage one, uh, again, and that is water education. Next slide, please. Okay, so what, what we're here today to talk about is smart irrigation controllers. Um, so water conservation rebate programs are designed to encourage Gilbert residents and build, uh, businesses to you know, adopt water saving technologies. And one of the things they like are financial incentives. Um, so um, with a smart irrigation controller, um, this is a, a tool that can be used that helps over watering um, with a properly programmed um, controller. Um, this would uh, reduce wasting water um, it would also um, improve the efficiency of the irrigation system along with enhancing plant growth and again reducing uh, water waste. What we've seen is that a lot of uh, traditional uh, irrigation systems, um, they over watering um, by two to five uh, times more than what uh, would be recommended. Um, so um, the smart irrigation controller can help people use less water, uh, save money, and also um, the smart irrigation controller rebate that we have, we really try to uh, communicate with our residents and our businesses that if you get the smart irrigation controller, please get a water efficiency check us from us too. Um, between these two, we have seen um, real water savings um, just by informing people, teaching people, because all of our water specialists are SmartScape certified, including myself, um, and it's our uh, advanced SmartScape. Um, so we are setting the example with um, water and schedules and water and efficiency, and the Smart Irrigation Controller is a great tool to help with that. Next slide, please. Um, so SRP um, in 2000, uh, well, 20, 2021, um, they teamed up with us to start a smart irrigation uh, controller program, or we teamed up with them. But um, so what we were able to do was donate 100 um, smart irrigation controllers to HOAs um, throughout the town of Gilbert. Um, and one of the requirements was that it would have to be installed by a landscape contractor who also was, uh, were trained on how to properly program the smart irrigation controller because that is extremely important that it is programmed correctly. Um, so what we were able to do with that was take a year of pre-data 
um, and then uh, uh, have them install it and uh, for a year after that year take the post data and compare the two and what we were able to determine is that we can average at least 12 percent reduction in outdoor water use per household again with a properly programmed smart irrigation controller um, so currently we have um, a budget approved for forty-five thousand um, dollars the smart irrigation um, uh, after the pilot program, sorry, we did launch the actual smart irrigation controller rebate program of the town of Gilbert. This started in September of 2022, um, and as of last week, we had 194 smart irrigation controllers um, issued, rebates issued. Um, residents can get one time per household of $250. Um, Non-residential HOA businesses can get 400 per site up to two, up to two times. A lot of them have larger areas. They have multiple irrigation systems. Um, so um, that was one, one of the benefits for the non-residential. Um, and again, benefits, smart controllers can prevent overwatering, um, more efficient, uh, and again, reduce uh, water and cost savings, or reduce water and, yeah, water and cost savings. Um, so um, we have currently applied for an additional 45,000 dollars uh, for the grant, which would help us expand the program and potentially reach an additional 600 um, customers. Um, next slide, please. So uh, the criteria for the evaluation. Um, so this project does support the augmentation for the water supply for the AMA by reducing uh, water waste on outdoor landscapes. The controllers help stretch municipal water resources further. Um, by adjusting watering schedules and amounts uh, based on real-time con uh, conditions, smart irrigation controllers um, can help ensure plants receive the optimal uh, amount of water. Um, and this also may help reduce peak time demand, which is very important to us. Um, this type of municipal incentive program aligns with um, the municipal demand reduction and conservation goals in the fourth and fifth Phoenix MA a M AMA management plan um, that states uh, to minimize waste of water supplies, maximize efficiency in outdoor watering, encourage reuse of water supplies, and improve water use efficiency as feasible. Um, so with that, again, I think the highlight, um, if you could, next slide, please. The town of Gilbert has a variety of different programs. We really see the smart irrigation controller um, significantly helping reducing outdoor irrigation use. Um, this past year in 2022, you can see our numbers. Um, this year, our goals are to have 500 water efficiency checkups. We do have over 313 HOAs and businesses in our uh, WaterWise Gilbert programs that we have water budgets for them and tools to make sure that they are within 120% of their water budget. And for those facilities that do meet that goal, they are recognized as WaterWise Gilbert. And we had 139 sites this past year that received that recognition. Um, next slide, please. Um, so I just wanted to give a, a special thanks to um, Nina from the Babbitt Center for Land and Water Policy uh, for all of her help and guidance with this grant. Um, and that is the end. So thank you all for your time and your consideration. We appreciate it. Any questions? Questions from the committee? So did you say that you hey, how, how many controllers you'll be able to? Are we talking a year or how many we? With the grant. Additional 600. Okay. Mm -hmm. And how many have you given out so far? Um, what was it, 139? It was on, what was it? 194. 194, yes, I'm sorry. Yeah. So this will be big growth then in that program. Yes. Um, and one of the strategies is um, for our outreach with this, we would be able to really target certain HOAs that we really see higher water usage um, and that we have relationships with the community managers. And um, we hope that with this funding, we can really target more certain areas to spread the information about, about this program. Go 
question. I have an irrigation box, probably everybody does. It's not smart at all. So what makes us <laughs> you're smart? So it's you have to get onto it has to be online, it has to be connected, okay. you have to have Wi Fi. And what it's able to do is it's able to like for us we have a, a weather station that's right in Gilbert that we use. Mm -hmm. So it's able to recognize real time weather and provide alerts. So if you had your water and schedule set for because in, in, we should only be watering our grass up to what, three times a week uh, in the summer. So, but it, let's say we, we had a monsoon and it rained, it would, it would recognize the weather station and say, oh, you received this much rain. You don't need to water for this long. So where a lot of people, they don't shut off their irrigation controllers after it rains. Um, so we had uh, my, my water resource manager, she has a smart irrigation controller and before she had it installed, um, you, after it rained, it would just turn on. Now, you know, she wasn't into irrigation. She didn't really care, you know, right, you know, whatever. Smart irrigation controls. She didn't water her irrigation outside, I, I, I think, until end of April. So from basically December to April, she didn't use any water outside at all for anything. Um, so it's really able to use the information out there and, and just make sure that we're watering more efficiently. So the grant, 200 per household? 250, 250 and then 400. It does. It Unless you're going high, high, there's some ratio ones that are really, really fancy. Yeah. Um, and it depends on how many stations you want in that. But $250, I think our average rebate for residential homes is under $200. Okay. All right. Great. So how does this work? Wait, what, the money goes for... Are we rebating? This the money is buying the controllers. It's rebating the controller for the residents. And so we're buying these very good controllers for the very poor people that live in Gilbert. Well, are we buying controllers or are we just letting them buy them and we're giving them rebates? So, yes. So, what they need to do is they need to buy it, they submit their receipt, and then we actually rebate them through um, a bill credit for their water. So they don't get any financial, like, they don't get money. They just get a bill of credit for their water. Okay. Which is almost as good as money. <laughs> yes. And, and again, the, a lot of people just need that little extra bump to say, okay, well, we'll do it now. Because they would still need an, uh, a landscape company to come out, change the, change the old one out, put the new one in, and that's still probably close to $2,000. So. And you, this is... Homeowners, uh, it's big waters like homeowners yes. association might have these lawns all the way around the development, mm -hmm. Absolutely. parks, and it'd be like uh, schools and churches that would have yep. this gross kind of ballpark. What percentage of the program would go to homeowners as opposed to major grass areas? So I'm going to say that it's just wild. I have the numbers. Oh, okay. So, but I, we have to say because if I give you the number without the contact, you wouldn't. So we have ordinances in place for new developments since um, 2001, I believe. That new developments have to is a requirement that they install a smart irrigation controller. So new developments, it's a requirement that they already have it. And most of these are the developments. They're not the actual HOA, so they have funding for it, so they never ask for a rebate, even though they could. Uh, well, actually, they probably couldn't because they're not, they don't have a, an account with the town of Gilbert. So right now, out of the 194, 192 have been residential. Okay. So it's, it's, it's almost entirely residential. Yes. Okay. But there is a requirement that those other developments, they, they have to have that controller now. Is there some kind of review? So do, does somebody, after six months or a year, look at uh, water saving? One, two, three, four, five, North or South XYZ Street, and see that in uh, 2023 you use this much water, and now that you got your new one, you're using this much. Mm -hmm. so, so, and so we are going to be part of the, the rebate program uh, once they complete the application is that it's an aggregated um, data. We collect aggregated data, so we're not sharing their personal information. 
uh, anything like that, but what we're going to see, yeah, yeah, yeah. we have the installation date of when we, when they installed the controller, and we take a year before that and see how much that water they use in that year, and then we're going to take a year afterwards and compare the two. Yeah, it doesn't make sense to do individuals, but as a, as a program as a whole, we, you're going to monitor the results. Mm -hmm be able to identify the savings is this. That is extremely important to the town of oh boy. <laughs> so, so that's part of the stipulation in the rebate program is that we're able to use that data. So you and are going to collect that. As you can see in the, the previous slide with our scorecards, um, all of that is kept through um, managing whatever service we provided them. So a lot of the, a lot of the um, landscape monitoring, we go out there, we do our water efficiency checkup they're watering every day. We're like, well, you shouldn't be watering every day. You should be watering three times a day. This is a good schedule for you. And then we're taking those water savings from what they were scheduled, what they were doing, to what they are now doing. Um, so it's, we need to track the data. So that's why part of the rebate program is for us to have that ability to track pre and post. Um, smart irrigation controller install. So these controllers are connected to the internet and you believe you can get internet reporting from them? No, we were, we're able to use their, their, um, their, their water, billing. Their billing. Okay. That's how we're getting it. So and again, that's why we, once we do the rebate, we also, we inform them that this is great that you're doing this, but we want to make sure we, we can assist you as much as we can, so please do a water efficiency checkup and then our specialists go out, who are all smart SmartSafe certified, um, and they verify that the schedule is good, the smart capability is on, because it needs to be turned on, that they're connected, um, and from there, they're good to go. It's not directly related, but I was, I, I guess I was ignorant and surprised. I was a little surprised that under the guaranteed water supply program that a city could pump 35% of their water supply out of the ground. We're, we're not. If oh, you go back, no. so I read the chart wrong. No, we, we're, we're 40, uh, no, we're, we're not. You're, no, we, we are. I read the chart wrong. We're, we're below safe yield. So okay. We, we so don't you, pump, and that's part of the reason why right now is we're trying to do these rebates because potentially we don't know the, the outcome of the, you know, uh, Colorado River we could lose a large portion of that 40%. No, yeah, it's 24% pump from wells. But, but I, I didn't know that, that was, was possible. 2022. So they have, but they the safe yield water. groundwater, we just do 4% we do for, the, for the safe yield groundwater. Okay. And the rest okay. is reclaimed. All right. We put back what we take out. Any further questions? Very good presentation. And what's the last one is the, uh, oh, that's the, so there's, both of these have been approved then? No, no. Just, just the SmartScape program has been approved. Uh, we're still seeking a recommendation on the Gilbert portion. So I think Anthony might go ahead. Anthony? What's no. For the, for the audience, I don't know if there's, now's the time or towards the end. Is it, does it have to do with Gilbert? Oh, just that program. Oh. Do you have a question or a comment? Yeah, just a question. Um, I was curious if Gilbert's uh, kind of using a strategy for the sources of water. So are you, are you trying to target just use or are you considering if they're on groundwater or SRP or CAB supplies? Water resources, because I'm just conservation. Yeah. Um, we, we do have um, some agreements in place. We're, we're, we're working with other cities to try to make sure that whatever happens, we have agreements in place so we can long-term storage credits to get water now. But but yes, we, we are working with other municipalities, other resources um, to try to make that up without altering the, any type of groundwater. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, uh, and I, on these two, so. Sorry, uh, Quincy, if I could interrupt. Sure. Uh, Melissa, Melissa Sykes, our WMAP coordinator, I believe she had a question. Sure. Melissa? Hi, Go just back. before we move, yeah, just, thank you. Just before we move on to uh, any of the WMAP updates or any decisions, can you, did you provide what the expected savings for a 12% average reduction across those 600 households would be? I may have We, we have. We have not, because that's, that's, 
the reason we say 12% is because you could have some homeowner, that's a difficult number to get. We would need real, real data for that because homeowner A and homeowner B are completely different. So the, the year study showed that each household was able to produce 12%. But somebody might be only using 15,000 a month, where somebody else might be using 45,000 a month. So that 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 really differs, and so we have to wait to see. Um, a lot since the program um, started in September of 2022, we don't have a full year of data yet. But we do have the SRP pilot program that we're basing our our information off of, because um, that what we do have a year before and a year after and average throughout all of those 100 homes was 12% savings. And we don't have uh, just a, a rough rough estimate of what the gallons or acre feet would be for that? Well, if we're doing, yes, if we're doing, if we're doing um, not acre feet, but basically we could say a range from 40 to 50 gallons per square foot. So, and that would again vary between lot size but we are comfortable to say and confident to say that um, you know there there's a savings um, potential um, for that. Forty to fifty square okay. foot annually. Per no, so well, you know I can't. You know what I'm going to take that. I'm not going to. I can get back to you, Melissa, on that because again we're just basing this off of. Um, the SRP pilot program. And what we did see was throughout the 100 homes that we, it was about 35,000 35, gallons saved per year. But the reason that number wasn't good was because we had a, a lot of high water users and then we also had a lot of low water users. So that number, even though that was the average, it was a lot higher for some people who weren't even using 10,000 square feet or 10,000 gallons a month. So that's why we can see the 12% savings per household on what their annual water use is. is. Okay, thank you. Hopefully I, I helped with that. <laughs> okay, so this item is posted for act. And uh, I, while we don't have to take action, uh, the department is asking if we have a recommendation on these two. Obviously, the first one has occurred, but if, in fact, we are supportive, it doesn't hurt for us to recommend approval, even though it's been approved. Uh, uh, but uh, what's, is there a motion? Do we want to hear? Um Melissa's update on the um, WMAP program activity first, or um, which is the third line yeah. item? If you'd like to do that, we can do that. Okay, thank you. Absolutely. Yeah. Melissa, go. Okay, thank you, Mr. Chair, and good afternoon, council members and members of the public. So I'm going to be going over the Water Management Assistance Program fund balance and the status of the DCP groundwater conservation grants. The current balance is $750,098. Of that, $285,337 is committed, leaving a balance of $464,761. We expect to collect about $202,000 next year, and with SmartScape being renewed for $112,896 for a term of two years, and if the town of Kilbert is funded for $45,000 for a term of two years, that would leave $306,865 in unobligated funds for the WMAP program. So the projects that are currently funded with the WMAP funds are the SmartScape Professional Landscape Training Program, the Water Conservation Management Program, the Residential Water Use Phase Two Project, and Arizona Project WET. The DCP leak detection project also receives $32,355 in WMAP funding. Next, I'll give an update on the groundwater conservation grant. The ESSER design uh, slash Arizona Project WET collaborative video series project was completed, as well as the as Gary Woodard's water efficiency audits for HOA common areas and other irrigation customers. 
They will be presenting at the next GUAC meeting, GUAC meeting to present their findings and all of the other projects are ongoing at this time. So that's all I have. If you have any questions, I'd be happy to, more than happy to answer those. So the bottom line is that there is funding available. Yes. And uh, the number is significant. Uh, that was it four hundred several yeah, three hundred thousand dollars. Yes. At this point. Okay. And uh, undoubtedly, there's more people that are hoping to get funding in the future. And I'm sure many of them will be. Yes, we have very good program. We have some legacy projects in that AMA. Okay. Right. Any questions from the committee? I don't have any questions. Good. <laughs> I have one for Leslie. Right. Okay. Well, SRP, couldn't you just fork out the 45 grand? <laughs> <laughs> well, it sounds like we already did the pilot project. <laughs> <laughs> how much was that? I don't. The same? I, I don't know. Do you know how much? It was before my time, okay. so I'm not sure. Yeah, I will say that it was before my time, too, um, at SRP. But uh, I, I know that we um, we just did a water conservation expo, and we do them pretty uh, often throughout the year, and we provide um, smart controllers at a reduced cost, and we provide a lot, thousands a year people come. Oh, I had to get one for you. Yes. <laughs> yes, I can work that out. Um, but I, I think it, it's a very, very successful program and people are very interested in it. It's a great time. Well, let's, let, let's start first. We'll start at the beginning. And the beginning is the SmartScape program. Uh, do we have a motion to recommend approval of that? Is somebody prepared to make a motion to? Oh. I don't make a motion if we need to, yeah. but. Um, Absolutely, to show support for that program. Yeah, motion, is there a second? We got a motion and a second. Is there any further discussion? Hearing none, all in favor signify by saying aye. 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 All opposed, nay. It passes unanimously on the three to zero vote. Let's next move to the Town of Gilbert Smart Irrigation Controller Program. Uh, is there a motion to recommend approval? I'll make that. Motion, is there a second? We've got a motion, a second. Is there any discussion before we vote? I I would like, and, and I, I understand the benefit of the program, um, I, I think evaluating programs like this is important, mm -hmm. that we really need to see that we're really saving water. Uh, you know, this money, it's paid by all sorts of people farmers, cities, businesses, and we are truly in a water jam in the state. So we need to be able to show that we're saving water and specific ground, specifically groundwater. So uh, uh, I, for at least if there were ever to have another phase of this thing, I would want to see very hard numbers that document that this truly has uh, resulted in a water savings that uh, that really is meaningful. If there's no further comments, all in favor of the motion to recommend approval signify by saying aye. 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 All opposed signify by saying nay. The motion passes unanimously, three to zero, and we are off to overdraft. Well, thank you, Chairman, for members of the council. <laughs> um, I have my name is Natalie Mast. I think you all know me at this point. <laughs> um, we had, the department had published a overdraft and state field report um, early last year, and we have had this on the agenda for a while and have not been able to get to it because you guys tend to have very full agendas. So, so I'm really pleased to be able to actually get to this today, even if it's a little bit late. Um, so what I'll be talking through is how we uh, developed a method to analyze safe yield and how we were kind of looking at the difference between overdraft and safe yield um, and the results of that particular analysis for the Phoenix AMA. 
uh, we developed this report uh, kind of in support as a supplemental document for the fifth management plan. So a lot of um, this analysis informed some of the discussions that were contained in the fifth management plans, which were adopted last year. So um, what is safe use? I will start with a definition here because this is important. So we have management goals for each of our initial AMAs. I'll say that we're still working on a management goal for our newest AMA, but we at least have our statutory management goals for the initial AMAs. Um, four out of our five AMAs have something related to a safe field for their goal. So Santa Cruz has maintaining safe field plus uh, preventing localized water table decline. Um, Prescott, Phoenix, and Tucson have a goal of achieving safe yield by the year 2025. Um, and the Pinal AMA's goal is different and focuses on uh, preserving agricultural economies while also allow allowing the development of non-irrigation uses. Uh, part of what we really wanted to focus on in this report was developing a method that would allow us to analyze all of those goals. Uh, despite their differences, acknowledging their differences, but also provide some kind of a metric for each of those goals. So safe yield specifically, since this is Phoenix AMA, um, safe yield has kind of three main components to the uh, statutory language, the statutory definition. You can see that on the left hand side of the slide. Um, so the first part being uh, it's a groundwater management goal that attempts to achieve and thereafter maintain. So thereafter maintain is an important part of this phrase, that it's not just about getting to safe field, but it's also keeping an AMA at safe field after it's achieved. So uh, attempts to achieve and thereafter maintain a long-term balance. So we have to think about maintaining the goal, and we also have to think about it in the long term. Uh, a long-term balance between the annual amount of groundwater withdrawn in an active management area and the annual amount of natural and artificial recharge in the active management area. So that last portion focuses on what, what we're going to kind of refer to as the third part here, which is annual. So really, this is an annual measurement that we have to kind of analyze the trends associated with that annual measurement in the long term. And we have to think about how we achieve and then maintain they feel in the, in the long term as well. So uh, we can't say an AMA has achieved safe field if they are not expected to thereafter maintain. So there's a little bit of a projection component here also. Uh, next slide, please. The uh, various management plans have included discussions of safe field over time. Um, what we discovered, though, as we dug through those past analyses, is that the methods have really changed a lot over time and were sometimes different across AMAs, and there hadn't been any clear or consistent analysis of safe field or, or very clear communication about the status of safe field in some time. So we wanted to do our best to remedy that, try to provide a consistent methodology across AMAs. Um, and a really clear method to communicate the status of the goal for each active management area, both to the public and also to the water community. And we'll talk a little bit how we've kind of developed two separate uh, communication methods to address those two different audiences. So um, I'm going to speed through a little bit of this because there's a whole lot of slides here. Um, over the course of 2019 through 2021, we did have a really extensive series of stakeholder meetings in support of the development of the fifth management plan. A part of those meetings was a safe field technical group. I know Anthony attended a whole bunch of those, so at least <laughs> so, some of you all are, are familiar with that process. Um, and we used that public forum to really get into the weeds of how we analyze safe field, what each of the components we consider are, and how we might want to think about analyzing safe field going forward, whether those are the correct components, whether we need to think about things in different ways. So moving kind of into the next section, 
um, we'll talk a little bit more about safe fields and overdraft. Um, we did spend a lot of time in that safe field technical subgroup just talking about what safe field even is. <laughs> and, and that turned out to be a really lengthy conversation and, and is something that I really consider to be a valuable part of, of what came out of that, um, of, of that group. Um, safe field has a statutory definition. I already talked about those three parts. Annual calculation, long-term balance, and thereafter maintained, right? Um, another important thing to note is that safe, the safe field goal is AMA scale. So what you might see is rising levels. So if an AMA is at safe field, you might see rising levels in one place and declining water levels in another place, but the AMA in theory could still be safe field. It's not a localized measurement. It's an average. It's an it's a AMA scale metric. And it's a groundwater focus metric. And this gets complicated in the context of recharge and recovery because not all the water that is underground is groundwater. Um, when water is stored underground, that water retains its legal character as whatever was stored. So if effluent is being stored underground, that remains legally effluent even though it's physically underground. We, so we don't include that stored water that's underground in our safe field analysis if it is not legally groundwater. And that adds a lot of confusion and complexity to this analysis. Let me ask you a question sure. just because I think this, I don't want to go too far past it. And you talked about the reality that this is uh, region wide right. or management area wide analysis. And it certainly makes sense that there'll be some areas that are down and other areas that are up. Having said that and having agreed that that does make sense, mm -hmm. we also have to make sure that none of the down areas are so far down that they're beyond any kind of help and create subsidence issues and other damaging. So, so it does make sense to some areas may be going up, other areas may go down. But even within that balancing kind of effort, don't we need to be aware that there shouldn't be any area that it's so far down that the earth is falling in and there's cascading and the ground is compressing and there's no way to ever put that water back down there. Sure, and, and thank you, Chairman uh, Fairbanks, that's a, that's a really good point. And, and I, I wouldn't want this to be construed to say that we don't care about all of those other things. Uh, what, what my point is here is that these definitions are part of the kind of statutory definition of the management goal. And we also track things like subsidence and water levels across the AMAs and across the state. And, and we do pay attention to each of those things. It may not specifically be part of the statutory management goal, but it is an important part of kind of broader water management, both in the AMAs and across the state. Is it really safe yield? If in fact the earth is crumbling under our feet, <laughs> under, is the that safe? under the statutory definition, it is. which okay. is what we are, are required to work with here, under the statutory definition, okay. uh, it could be. I'm in. <laughs> Good. And, and thank you for that question. I appreciate that. Um, and actually, this next part here kind of gets to that. So safe field is not necessarily a set volume. We can't necessarily say you can pump X number of acre feet and that is fine, that is, you'll be a safe field, because things fluctuate over time. And so we really wanted to capture that in this analysis that um, both natural inflows fluctuate over time and artificial inflows might fluctuate over time. So it, we really have to look at very long-term averages in some cases to understand where we might be at for safe field in a, in a given year. Safe field is not a measure of aquifer health. <laughs> and, and I think that precisely gets to your point there, Frank, that, that it's not a metric about water level declines. It's not a metric about um, subsidence or fissures. It's really this groundwater-focused water budget 
very specifically looking at the basin scale, looking at the AMA scale. Um, it's also forward looking. So it does not solve cumulative overdraft. Uh, safe yield is, is forward looking in the sense of we say achieve and thereafter maintain. We don't say achieve and refill the declines that have already happened. <laughs> um, so where the ha there has been overdraft in the future, you may have seen water levels drop and there may have been subsidence, which means that some of those water, uh, some of that was that those water level declines might not be able to be rebounded or refilled in certain cases. Um, so it's, it's not intended to be something that would solve that historic cumulative overdraft, but rather balance and maintain going forward. Uh, next slide, please. Could I have a, just a quickie? Sure. Yeah, who, who, which one of our agencies is responsible for measuring the, the recharge? Uh, ADWR also does that. So um, depending on the precise type of recharge we're talking about, uh, we look at it in a number of different ways. So we might look at um, natural or incidental recharge, so natural being kind of our stream bed or mountain front recharge. Our hydrology group looks at a lot of that information. Uh, for things like incidental recharge, often our AMA staff or sometimes our, also our hydrology staff will look at things like incidental recharge. Um, uh, the portion of agricultural water usage that ends up seeping into the ground. Um, and we also look at intentional artificial recharge. And we have a specific recharge and recovery team that, that um, permits and tracks all of that recharge. And in the past several years, don't you now have a system that, while it cannot follow every location, do you have a system that kind of, I don't want to say in real time, but does monitor the generalized level of waters throughout the AMA. Sure. So our field services team does uh, what we refer to as well sweeps, uh, where they go out across the state. This isn't just in the AMA. We do this statewide and actually measure water levels in various wells. We have a system of uh, what we refer to as index wells, which are ones that we have some time history for, so we can see how water levels in a given place might have changed over time. Um, so yes, in that we way, have we, some good data we, on we have, where water levels really are. We have some good data. Um, in some areas, it's sparse. In some areas, we've seen um, gradual reductions over time in the number of wells that we're able to keep in our index line. Um, so that's something that we're always looking for additional folks who are willing to participate and let our staff uh, come out and measure their water levels with their wells. Uh, Mr. Bales, if you, if you know anyone, we'd be happy to add folks to that index well line. I can measure some of mine. <laughs> but within, you know, and, and the state's a big area. Right and a lot of different conditions. But in this AMA, while it's not perfect data measurement, my sense in the past was that you had a pretty good system on a on sort of a broad level to, to know where water levels are going up and where they're going down. Yeah, and, and just kind of the nature of the AMA is that they tend to be a little more densely populated, which means often there tend to be more wells. Um, so, so we do have sometimes, in a lot of cases, we have um, maybe denser data points across the AMAs just as a function of population density. Um, so, so we do have fairly good data across the Phoenix AMA. We've got a, a model across the Phoenix AMA. Yeah. Um, but obviously some sense. of those data points might be sparser in other areas. Yeah. Um, so, how we are looking at overdraft versus safe yield. Um, ultimately, what this comes down to is a water budget. So, for overdraft, the way, the way we're kind of using these terms is overdraft is really your single point in time measurement. Overdraft is really going to be your annual measurement. In one year, you had this much water coming in and this much water going out and the kind of balance between those two numbers is either going to be net recharge or net overdraft in that year. In order to 
look at something like St. Peel, we have to understand those overdraft trends over time. So we want to be able to compare different years to each other across time. What we end up seeing with real data is that real data is noisy. Um, and so we, with that long-term balance, we developed a little bit of a method to help smooth some of that long-term data so that we can better understand kind of the directionality um, for long-term overdraft or safe field. Um, next slide. There we go. And this is where it kind of gets into this uh, safe field discussion where that overdraft piece is really just kind of those pluses and minuses. It's very easy to make that very quantitative. This long-term piece ends up being a little more qualitative because we're looking into the future, particularly for that thereafter maintained portion. Uh, we, we have to consider things like shortage on the Colorado River and how that might impact groundwater content. And there's Inevitably, there, there are ways to obviously quantify that with different types of projections, but inevitably there's a little bit of uncertainty there. And so those qualitative discussions around that type of uncertainty are really important for the context here. So in that uh, subgroup, we had some pretty significant goals of um, establishing methods both for that annual overdraft for assessing overdraft in the long term and also uh, developing the communication strategy. Um, really kind of addressing each of those components of safe field that I talked about before, where it's um, annual components, long term components, and then thereafter maintain how do we how do we actually think about and communicate all of those things. Next slide, please. Oh, uh, part of what we really wanted to look at in that technical group was what are the components of safe field? Um, and what you can see on the screen here are the various components that we include in a given safe field calculation. So on the kind of middle column here, we have inflows. On the right-hand column, we have outflows. So inflows being what's going into the aquifer, your supply. Outflows being what's coming out of the aquifer, either naturally or from human demand. <laughs> the items highlighted in blue are items that we're able to get from the ADWR's regional groundwater flow model. Um, so those are items that we collaborated with our hydrologists on. Um, and the items in gray is data that we're able to get from our AMA annual reports. So annually reported data from the largest water users across the AMA. Oh, I'm sorry, I should back up a little bit. Um, so this is this is really kind of the basis of the safe field calculation is inflows minus outflows equals overdraft. Um, so at its core, it sounds really simple, but obviously once you start looking into each of those components, it can get really complicated really fast. We yeah, we have overdraft balance. Are you missing a third one? Would there be a plus category? Retard. Um, so, so in, sorry, inflows, inflows and outflows. Inflows would be kind of your recharge category, right. either natural or artificial. Mm -hmm. Outflows would be all of those things that are mm -hmm. causing water to come out of mm -hmm. the aquifer, whether it's pumping or some kind of mm -hmm. natural discharge. But the mm -hmm. opposite of overdraft is oh, net recharge. Sure. It could be, either could be. If there be was a such a thing. So we developed a data dashboard. I have been really proud of our team over the development of assist management plans for the number of dashboards and the amount of data that we were able to make available to the public. This one's a little bit hard to look at, but we really wanted to provide something that was this detailed, showing all of those different components and how it plays into this calculation. So if you look at the items on the bottom, those are all of your inflows. That's all the water coming into the aquifer. All of the items above that kind of zero axis are all of your demands. That's the water coming out of the aquifer. So, if that, that the black line represents basically a balance between the top bars and the bottom. The net. That's the net, exactly. 
So when you put those pluses and minuses together, that's what you get. This is a this is your graphed out um, annual overdraft. Or if you look at, I think it's about 1993 when we had a pretty major flood year. Uh, you can see that there was a pretty substantial net recharge event in that in that year. Um, if we go to the next slide, this version is a little bit easier to look at and really just shows the inflow outflow. But again, this is available on our website um, and is, is kind of an interesting thing to play around with. You can click around in the different components and highlight and filter for different things. At the time. So we've got our annual overdraft. We were able to, to measure that annual overdraft over time. We then wanted to, like I said, develop a method to smooth some of those um, components to better understand um, what, what the trends are in the long term. So we went through a number of different thought processes on this, looking at specific time frames, looking at uh, averages by sector, looking at specific influences. And ultimately, what we ended up doing pretty so what we ended up doing here was acknowledging that natural components and human influence components really operate on different cycles. So we used different averages for those natural components as opposed to those uh, human cost components. So for those natural inflows, your your stream flow, uh, stream bed recharge, your mountain front recharge, those types of things, we use a 20-year rolling average just because those thematic types of influences tend to be on much longer cycles than things like something. Um, so for those natural components, we use a 20-year rolling average. For the artificial components, or kind of those human-related components, things like your groundwater demands, ag, mini, industrial, um, and um, also things like artificial recharge, where there's a cut to the aquifer, those types of things. Um, we used a three-year rolling average for those types of components because those are the ones that do tend to shift a little more rapidly over time. So what you can see with this, as compared to that first graph that I showed, where there was a lot of noise, it was kind of all over the place in, um, in uh, with the black line. This one is a lot smoother and allows you to really visualize a lot better what that directionality might be over time. We were really pleased with how this really nicely smoothed things and it allowed that, um, those longer term trends to be visualized really nicely. This chart that we're seeing, this is reported data for pumping and recharge, mm -hmm. and it is not observed water levels in the ground. So. I'm asking. I'm yes, and, and it's a little bit tricky because some of the, particularly the natural components of recharge, things like stream bed recharge, um, uh, some of the riparian type demands we obtain from our groundwater models. And those are calibrated based on those observed water levels physically in the ground. So there is a component where some of those are considered at least for those portions that we, uh, at least for those pieces of data that we get from our groundwater models. Um, <laughs> I, I know this gets complicated really fast. No, no, so, yeah, and it is, it is very complicated. So you measure uh, uh, groundwater levels for certain criteria and use the measured level as opposed to the nominal level of recharge? Sort of. <laughs> <laughs> Um, and not directly, not 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 exactly in that okay. way. Um, the the way the way it works is when they're creating the groundwater models, they use those physical measurements to kind of truth, if you will, the the various components that go into the model. So they might make adjustments based on physical measurements, like oh, we said there was this much going into the aquifer over here, but we're seeing water levels rise more than that, so we might adjust that number in order to better reflect the physical reality. We've got to be careful of that because the water moves. 
Sure. And that's we have a <laughs> we have a real propensity in our district to bank water at the top of uh, riverways, and water, darn it, proceeds to flow downhill. <laughs> sure. And and the groundwater models are able to account for that. Okay. Right. We have years and years of modeling. You're sending it all to Buckeye. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yes, Right. I, I, just say, I think that is what it's become now, is that we can, we can test our theories with the model and then hone our, hone the theories with the model. To, I mean, we can, we can compare back and forth to make sure that our assumptions are, yeah. in fact, correct. Okay. Yeah. And was that through 2019? Is that what that little number down there at the bottom? So, um, our groundwater models do lag behind our AMA reported data. So it takes us most of a year. So let me back up. Uh, in, so say for this current year, we received 2022 annual reports in March, just a few months ago. It will take us through about November to get all that data entered, uh, quality checked, and compiled in a way that our hydro team can actually use it. So around November, we'll actually pass it off to their, the hydro team. And then it takes another year or more for them to be able to incorporate that fresh data set into the actual models that they work on. So it takes quite a bit of time for, this, for the updated data to really filter through all the way to the groundwater models. So, so these, uh, these data sets are a couple years behind. All right, and we've finally gotten to uh, the communication strategy, uh, the thereafter achieve and thereafter maintain. So how do we actually talk about safe yield? How do we actually analyze safe yield? Can we ever say that AMA is that safe yield, they're good? <laughs> and the answer to that is <laughs> it's complicated. <laughs> so what we tried to do was develop a communication method that acknowledges some of that complexity, that, that uh, creates space for some of that nuance to come through. So like I said earlier, there might be um, things that impact the achieve and thereafter maintain portion, uh, things like Colorado River shortage that I pointed out earlier. There is variability with different types of surface water supplies that um, can come into play. Uh, there might be increases in certain allowable demands, whether it's um, existing grandfathered rights simply use, utilizing more of their allotments or growth of other types of demands. Um, and the other thing to note here is that we have a set of regulatory tools, the shared water supply, the management types of mandatory conservation requirements. In, in some cases, because of a lot, of, because the Groundwater Management Act did allow for some increases in allowable uses and ongoing allowable uses, uh, some of the influence of those regula regulatory tools might be limited in different ways. Um, we are only able to push conservation under each plan so far. So while we might be able to kind of put things into the right direction, we can't necessarily say. Phoenix is going to <laughs> achieve safe yield by 2025 no matter what the impact is, that's not reasonable. And, and that's something that was really built into that goal with attempts to achieve. It's kind of a reasonability standard that is built into the goal. Uh, um, so, was that the same one? I don't know. Sorry, I'm lost on my slides here. So. A part of the dashboard that we developed has these communication tools. So um, this dashboard, like I said, this is on our website. Uh, each of the screenshots we've shown, where it's the, the really detailed um, annual overdraft and the long-term one, and then this kind of communication component, all of those are kind of different pages within the dashboard, so you can scroll through to get to the different pages. Um, but here, what we, what we did is we created this layout where you can really look at where a given AMA is. And rather than just giving you numbers or a graph and saying, figure it out, <laughs> we, we added some description for each of the AMAs. 
So first on the left hand side we do have a definition of um, overdraft and talking about that annual and long term balance. In the center portion we talk a little bit more about safe yield and how we look more toward those long term trends. The yield is a management goal for the Prescott Tucson. Prescott Phoenix Tucson, the yield is a portion of things. So this is this is really our um, communication method for the general public where it can seem a little bit more education as a portion of this. And you can see, so year of the management goal assessment, 2019, we're looking specifically at the Phoenix AMA. You can filter through the different AMAs. And you can see a little snippet about where the Phoenix AMA was or is as of 2019. Um, for the Phoenix AMA, there, the trend is still that it, it is out of safe yield. It is not at safe yield, and it is unlikely at this point to achieve safe yield uh, by 2025, given the regulatory limitations, given the resources, and given some of the challenges of Colorado River shortage and the resources to it. Next slide, please. This is the more detailed version of that communication dashboard. So, and what you see kind of in the different columns is we might either have values or we might have check boxes or X's. The X's represent basically a no determination where a check box would indicate yes. So what we're looking at for uh, annual, uh, the X indicates that, that um, there is annual overdraft in the most recent year for the Phoenix AMA, which was 2019, at the bottom. The two X's in under long-term overdraft, the um, first X says status. So what that refers to is where that long-term average line is now. Is it above or below the axis? And that long-term average for the Phoenix AMA, as of our last measurement, was still above that axis. So it is not currently at a safe yield point. The uh, second one in that column refers to the direction. Is it increasing or is it decreasing going in the direction of safe yield? And unfortunately, that long-term line for Phoenix uh, as of the last uh, three years prior to uh, when we published this um, was going in an increasing direction, so it's showing some increase in overdraft over time. The next column provides a little bit of uh, context, some additional values. So uh, with that 2019 data, we were looking at an average of about, or a single year, uh, sorry, excuse me, we were looking at a single year measurement of overdraft at, at um, over 300,000 acre feet per year, which represents about 35% of groundwater demand in the AMA and about 14% of total demand for the AMA. So what I would maybe emphasize here is that the reason we have more than one number there is that 300,000 sounds like an awful lot and would be an awful lot in the context of some of the other AMAs. And as 14% of total demand might be something that could sound a little bit more achievable and is something that we can directionally move toward addressing. The next couple um, sections here are really kind of the more qualitative discussion. We talked about that quantitative side and this is really where we get to the more qualitative side. Thinking about things like what is the impact of uh, Colorado River shortage? What might be the impact of things like adjudication or climate change? Um, and what is our outlook in terms of actually addressing that variability and also the overdraft with the existing regulatory tools that we have. Um, and that, I know it's a little bit hard to see on the screen, it's a little bit small. It says increasingly difficult to achieve the goal with existing um, Management goal status, this is finally just a little bit of a statement about where we are at in terms of safe yield. Not at safe yield and will be unlikely to achieve and maintain safe yield given the resources and regulatory tools that are currently available. Um, oh, and I we apparently have slides going through each of those and I just talked through it, sorry about that. <laughs> like I said, uh, we have really extensive information available on our website. The full report 
is available on our management plans page on the website. Uh, the dashboard is available on our AMA data page on the ADWR website. And obviously the FIS management plans which were adopted last year are also available there. With the development of the FIS management plans, we worked through a lot of details and a lot of different concepts. And we also on our website have a, what we refer to as our 5MP concepts page. Um, which is a really unique thing. I still haven't seen another example quite like this, where even the concepts that didn't make it into the best management plans, as we were discussing them over time, we would post every single concept on that web page, along with data, either in support or not in support of it, along with public comments that we received related to it, and with links to all of our public meetings. So it was really our one-stop shop for everything around the development of the FIS management plans. And that was something, especially in pandemic times, which was when we were developing those FIS management plans, it was something we were really proud of in terms of making sure that we were allowing for transparency in that process. Um, yeah, so I just really wanted to emphasize that all of these materials are available online. I would really encourage you all to check it out. Um, and I believe that's the last slide. So with that, I'd be glad to take any additional questions that you might have. Questions or comments? Wow. Wow, mm -hmm. that's right. Good overview. <laughs> I know it's mega complicated. There's a lot there. Yeah. Good job. Thank you. Thanks, Matt. I I'm impressed. I'm glad we had the briefing, and I will go look at the website. And it's always good to get uh, the shock of reality. <laughs> I I think what I didn't hear here and maybe there's no reason to hear it, is that part of what uh, drive us, I'll say us, is all of us that care about the water situation, is to remember the reality of attitudes out there, the great, the great unwashed, that, that will never understand that presentation. And it's, it's kind of illuminating to watch this, I guess I'll call it a circus that's going on about Saudi Arabia water in southern Arizona. And uh, that kind of circus could go on any day, anywhere. And we all know that the water regulations in Arizona are, in fact, some of the toughest in the in the country. And I happen to know about some of the regulations in California, which are just about non-existent, just you know, compared to what we have here. But I think we need, we just need to keep in our mind that the public opinion matters, and that we got to be ready for it. Now, maybe one of the best things you can do to prepare for public opinion is to be honest and truthful and to just expose the truth. The truth will set you free. Yeah. Uh, but, but um, so great presentation. And let's move on to state white plan updates. Can everybody hear me okay? Yes, we can hear you. Okay. All right. Well, good afternoon. Uh, my name is John Riggins. I'm the statewide planning manager here at ADWR, and I apologize for not being there in person, um, but I'd like to provide you a, a brief overview of some of our planning activities, including the Governor's Water Policy Council, their committees, and also the new ADWR supply and demand assessment. So regarding the council, the uh, Governor's Water Policy Council was created on January 9th of this year and tasked with modernizing the Arizona Groundwater Management Act. Um, they were tasked by Governor Hobbs to provide proposals for consideration by this December. The council last met for their first meeting on May 17th of this year 
based on the council's focus areas and objectives, uh, two committees were formed. Those are the Assured Water Supply Committee and the Rural Groundwater Management Committee. The Assured Water Supply Committee last met on June 27th, and their next committee is tentatively scheduled right now for August 15th at 1 p.m. Um, at the department. The Rural Groundwater Committee uh, last met on June 29th. Uh, their next meeting is tentatively scheduled at ADWR for August 17th at 10 a.m. Um, again, those meetings are, are subject to change, but we have them updated on our ADWR public meetings calendar. Both committees at their last meetings formed subcommittees to help better evaluate and discuss the proposals and have more detailed technical discussions regarding any sort of recommendations to move forward to the full committee and full council. Uh, any meeting presentations, committee notes, information, we're publishing all of those on the ADWR Governor's Water Policy webpage, and I'll put that uh, link here in the chat when I'm finished. Um, we also have a new Governor's Water Council coordinator at the department, Trent Blumberg, and he'd be happy to answer any questions related to the council, the committee's upcoming meetings, and any meeting information that we have available. And I'll put his uh, contact information in the chat as well. The next full council meeting is tentatively scheduled for the end of August, August 30th at 1 p.m. And that will be hosted at ADWR as well. So real quick here, next I'll cover the ADWR supply and demand assessment, uh, which I had briefed at the last GUAC meeting that we are in the first year of our groundwater assessment and we're actually several months into our first year of conducting a supply and demand assessment of several groundwater basins within the state and those for those of you who aren't familiar there was new legislation in 2022 requiring adwr to conduct a supply and demand assessment of all 51 groundwater basins in the state over a course of five years for year number one, we are conducting our analysis in seven groundwater basins. Those are McMullen, Butler, Tiger Wash, and Harquahala in the West Valley, or West portion of the state, excuse me, and Wilcox, Douglas, and San Bernardino Valley down in Southeast Arizona. So we have assembled and recruited an amazing team. Um, they are on track to provide our first year findings by the December 1st statutory deadline, and we are currently having our internal discussions for our plans uh, in year two of the assessment in 2024. So that is just a quick overview of some of the planning activities. I'll put the information in the chat for the new Governor's Water Council webpage. Um, we already have quite a bit of information for both committees, the Rural Groundwater Committee and the Assured Water Supply Committee on our page. And again, if you have any questions, um, you know, please don't hesitate to, to contact myself or uh, Trent if you have any questions about the Governor's Council. So with that, I will take any questions. Okay. So are you on that council? I am on the council, yeah. yes. And I'm on the Assured Water Supply subcommittee. Sure. Committee. Sorry. Um, are the committee are the subcommittees made up of council members? Yes. The, actually, yes. So um, there are there's the two committees, the shared water supply and rural water, and then the subcommittees mm -hmm. will be the technical folks, um, which are not necessarily policy council members, yeah. but staff. To the chair. They, with the change of the executive office, did the leadership stay the same with the committee? Or does the governor get to choose the chair? Or how did that it, The governor established the committee, um, and so it, we, it just started in January. Okay, just started in January. So I believe that Tom Chucky is chairing it. So, mm -hmm. Correct. The, the governor's executive order names uh, the director of the Department of Water Resources as the, the chair to the council. And I would just add one comment to that, is that um, it's scheduled, you know, we just started meeting in May, but it's really scheduled for recommendations by December, so it's going to be a very quick process. Mm -hmm. yeah. 
Uh, were there any questions by the audience? No questions in the chat. Any questions here? Well, thank you. What an excellent presentation. In very few minutes, you answered all the all the questions. <laughs> Good job. Thank you. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay, Good, moving, thank you. moving right along. Uh, the next is call to the council on this opportunity for council members to say, well, we'd like to talk about this in the future, or I'd like to see this new idea or change or whatever. So I don't know if anybody has any. I don't have any comments. Okay. Any topics you'd like to hear about at our next meeting? It's fine if you don't. <laughs> if you do, now's your mm -hmm. chance. <laughs> Uh, open meeting on all that stuff. Sure. <laughs> Do we have time in between to think about things too? Sure. Think so. Okay. Well, hearing none, we'll do a call to the public. If, if any of the public has to comment on anything on the uh, agenda, either in, here in person or uh, on the internet. Seeing none, uh, is there a motion to adjourn? Motion, and without objection, we stand adjourned. <laughs> there we go. Very nice. On time, even. Perfect. I know, almost exactly. Yes. Way, to, way to do it, Jim. Yes, thank you. When do you think we'll meet again? Uh, so we'll meet in